Welcome to Conversations with Toy, a blogcast tackling life one episode at a time. This is the time to air out life's craziest moments. This space is all about speaking about life's hang-ups and ways in which we can leave better than when we started. Topics are all about ways we can find space to be better in life, love, mental space and health. Happy Friday. I hope that you have had the most amazing week. Welcome to Conversations with Toy. I am Toy, the podcaster, but I'm not just a podcaster. I am also a content creator and blogger um, that talks about lifestyle, mental health as well. And obviously in this space, I'm going to be talking about things like mental health, self-care, and what's happening on these internet streets. Sometimes I'll bring you guests, sometimes it'll be just me, but I hope that whatever conversation that we are having, I hope that it is something that fills you up, it challenges you, it makes you think, it makes you aware and see yourself maybe for the first time. Whatever the case, welcome. I am so happy that you are here. This is the ninth season, so that means that you have plenty of content that whatever you're going through, whatever you have on your heart, whatever you got going on, I'm sure I've had a conversation about it. But we are going to continue with today's conversation. We do have a guest, and I will get to her, who is an amazing, amazing writer. And I I don't know, I guess I feel a little, not selfish, but I feel good about the fact that it's good to talk to another writer because as a writer, when you talk to someone else who writes, you see yourself, you hear yourself, rather you're, it doesn't matter what you're writing about. You just know that the challenges that come along with writing, the vulnerability that comes along with writing. And I'll share some more of my personal story. Once we talk about our guests and get into that conversation, I really want to share that because I do hope that if somebody who is listening, one thing that I want to encourage you is If you start something, 90% of the time, your family and friends will throw some salt into your plans. Is it because they're natural born haters? Some of them are. Yes, some of them are. But you don't have time to figure out which ones are natural born haters or which one is trying to give you, you know, feedback that might be able to be helpful. Take it in, listen, and keep it moving. But when you have something on the inside of you, you got to get it out. And it's going to be some of the most lonely traveling moments of your life when you go to write something and you're being vulnerable and you're sharing your story. You're going to have other key people that played a part in that story that are not going to agree with you. They're going to have something to say about what you're saying. Who's going to be telling you that you're doing too much? Whatever the case may be, I'm going to encourage you before we get into that conversation to keep going. Now, Right before we get into our wonderful guest today, can we just have a conversation about the fact that, first of all, it is Friday, December the 1st. That means we are in the last month of the final quarter and the last month of 2023. And this month is going to be pushed around between holiday stuff, whether you got Hanukkah, you got Christmas, you got Kwanzaa, you got all kinds of things happening. And so this month is going to fly so fast. Do you hear me? We're literally at the end of the the year and I'm sitting here saying to myself, how did we get here? How did we get here? Like time is on explosion, like explosion, because how did we get here? I remember starting January 1st of 2023, and now we're almost about to do January 1st of 2024. So with today being the December 1st, I am going to be taking my daughters to go see the Beyonce movie. Now, I didn't think about it at the time about whether or not, first of all, I didn't think about it because the way them ticket prices were set up, there was no way I was taking me and the girls. I have two daughters and a son to go see Beyonce in concert because... Mm -mm. and I don't want to be sitting in those bleeds now gratefully thankfully gratefully we were able to find tickets um, the first time for our first show which we saw here in Philly for in my opinion pennies on a dollar 
And you know what I love? I said this before, before her, before I went to her concert, was that everybody was complaining about how high the tickets were. There were a lot of tickets that were high, but they were a lot of them were high because people wanted to sit in the beehive, like they wanted to be right at her feet. They wanted to be in that area. Now I'm not gonna sit there and lie and act as if like if I couldn't get those tickets and it wasn't setting me back and I didn't care about it and I was good with it that I wouldn't have, you know, been what, you know, I wouldn't have been all crazed because if you are a true fan, you're going to want to see your person. Now, let me just, let me just say this. <sighs> Come on and lean in. Why do grown people get worked up about what other grown people are paying and doing? I said this before. Remember, you know, back in when we were kids and I say we, cause I'm in my forties. So thinking about the times where like I was a kid, my parents were grown or when my parents were kids, like seeing people like Michael Jackson, seeing people like, you know, all of the greats, Prince, all of these great, great musicians, people spent what they wanted to spend and did what they decided to do. Now we're in 2023 and we're in this time. And I have seen so many people getting upset about what somebody else done paid to go see something. Now, Beyonce don't have to be your favorite. You can't be a part of the beehive and not have her be your favorite, but you could still not have Beyonce be your favorite. But I am just respectful of the fact that when I hear people say, oh my God, I went to Taylor, Taylor Swift. I went to go see this concert. I went to see that concert. I'm like, good for you. Because you know why? Didn't nobody send me an email or an invoice and say, could you help a sister out to get to these concerts? Like nobody asked me to pay for it. So because nobody asked me to pay for it, and they didn't ask me to cover for them for whatever they couldn't pay after they went to the concert. It ain't no skin off my back about what somebody went to go see. So for all of us who are Beyonce fans or just curious and just want to go see this movie, go see it. I am telling you now, I am not listening to not near friend, foe, or enemy. Tell me about, oh my God, you went to go see the concert twice and then you went to go play, see the movie. Uh, Yeah, I did. Yes, ma'am. Or yes, sir, whomever. Yes, I did. Because I enjoy my artists that I enjoy, right? And so I just want to be clear about that. And I paid for those movie tickets on my own. I'm going to go see it. I'm going to enjoy it with my daughters and one of my best friends. Like, that's what we're going to do. My issue with this Beyonce, this is the real reason why I brought this up. Colorism is such a huge problem in the African-American community. It literally gets on my nerves. I cannot stand the fact that we already have outside influences who would not accept us because we were black. It didn't matter what shade or level of black, just being black was just not acceptable, right? And then we get amongst our own people and we got to hear somebody say, you're not, you're too dark. You're not light enough. You need to have a certain hair length because if your hair is too naughty and too quote unquote nappy and too this and too that, why are y'all concerned about the fact that you're trying to say that Beyonce is trying to be a white woman? I'm literally in a state of confusion. Y'all do know lighting does work. Now I am a chocolate brown skinned girl. If you give me the right lighting, I'm going to look a little lighter. Beyonce is already a light skinned brown, I mean, light skinned black girl. Given the right lighting, which I'm sure mother had the quality lighting, she is going to look lighter. How many songs does Beyonce have to have now at this point? We literally celebrated Renaissance. Renaissance was about going back and celebrating life. Renaissance was an, a, a push for the, the gay, the, a, the, the LGBTQ plus community. It was a nod to being beautiful and black. It was a nod to being um, an entrepreneur and not taking nobody's stuff. It was a nod to saying, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of giving my time to these jobs that ain't doing, I'm going to build me something. Like it was a nod to all these glorious things. And the only thing y'all got to talk about is if this woman who has a beautiful set of black little girls, beautiful uh, black son and y'all concerned about whether or not she wants to be a white woman she could be whatever color she wants to be the woman is talented right and i love the fact that tina knows was like stop it right there pump your brakes because we need more of that basically tina knows said go ahead and mind your business and go sit in that corner and eat your rice that's what she told you to do she said sit in that corner eat your rice be quiet don't say nothing 
because my daughter don't be bothering nobody and here y'all come talking and you know what's amazing to me it's the same ones that's talking that was in their silver at the concert talking about you won't break my soul remember y'all was when y'all was in your circle dancing with your girlfriends right you remember that when you was out there you know walking 2011 miles in your heels to go see beyonce then the ones that was sitting at home talking about oh my god i wish i could go and was contemplating watching everybody else's stories who was at these concerts it's y'all y'all got to get it together because it ain't me i don't care beyonce is beyonce she's always been light skin she's not light skin to the point where she looks white but she's light skin and so we got to stop this colorism crap that happens in our own community because y'all sat up there and debated this crap online and i'm saying really Y'all wasn't worrying about the fashions. Y'all wasn't worrying about the fact that Destiny's Child had basically had a reunion except for uh, Farrah. Is that her name? Because Lord knows we don't even talk about her no more. But she burnt her own bridges by not doing what's right. Like if you ain't calling them to rehearsals and you ain't acting right, it's one thing for us to have a disagreement about power, but it's another thing for you not to even show up to the party. However, we got to see Destiny's Child unite a beautiful a, a unification of something that could have just been all wrong all these years. Y'all didn't pay no attention to that or you saw it, glanced at it, made one comment, but y'all focused on whether or not she wants to be a white woman. Stop playing with people. And I say that as a part of like the beehive. I say that as I feel like I'm the, you know, the uh, executive assistant for Beyonce, a part of the beehive. I'm saying that for her, but she don't need me to speak for her. Her one, her accolades speak for her. Her talent speaks for her. And the fact that this movie is really focused on you know, the concert, all the background stuff. But the fact that as a black woman, she decided to take charge. Like I'm, I'm coming in here, I'm taking charge. We're going to have this show my way. And I'm going to push back through everything that you are do giving and throwing my way. That's what I'm going to do. That's what this movie is supposed to be focused on. Now, the only problem I have is the alleged conversation that Blue Ivy read some of you raggedy adults comments. And this is exactly why you got to be who you were supposed to be online. This is exactly why you have to stop being ma malicious and mean, ignorant and rude and every level of wordage, because are y'all insane to sit there and make these comments about a little girl? Well, she ain't hitting it hard and she wasn't doing that. She on stage with her mama, Beyonce, who is of the, the, the Chris Browns and the Michael Jacksons. This, this is our prime time artists for us right and y'all sit up there talking about her daughter who gets on that stage and does what she do some of y'all couldn't even get tickets to the nosebleed section up all the way at the top holding up being an usher at the thing and y'all worrying about what that beautiful young girl is doing dancing with her mom learning 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 about what it takes to go out there and put out a show learning what it takes to be an amazing businesswoman listen i'm no beyonce but I love the fact that as a blogger, as an as influencer, as somebody who actually owns her business, right? Owns her website, owns her business, does all the things. I love the fact that my daughters get to see me be a phenomenal wife. They get to see me be an amazing mother, but they also see me not putting my dreams to the side because in the name of motherhood, right? They get to see me leave this house when I leave. They get to see me rub elbows with some of the greats. They get to see me out here getting this coin. They get to see me doing that so that when they decide that they want to do whatever it is that they want to do, they would never have an excuse to be able to say that they can't do it all without the right balance in place. That's what Beyonce's daughter, that's what, that's what Blue Ivy was learning. But y'all sat up there, some of y'all sat up there, have the audacity, the unmitigated gall to talk about somebody else's child. And you know the code. You know the code. The code is all children should always be off limits. Y'all done talked about this baby's hair not being done. This child got more hair than some of y'all and ain't had in y'all whole life. You ain't got enough inches to buy to get to this point, right? I just need us to take a step back. This isn't about me being rah-rah for Beyonce because I am. But it's about the fact that when did y'all lose y'all coof? When did you lose it? Like, did you drop it on the way to, to where you were supposed to be trying to get to? Because I'm confusion. We've got to stop making fun of children, saying comments about other people's kids. Because I'm from that mindset of the old school that, you know, you, you can knock if you buck if you're talking about somebody's kids and they somebody's mama. Somebody's kids and somebody's mama, you 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 better be ready to throw hands. That's That's just what it boils down to. 
but I will be seeing that today. I am so excited. So I will report back next week on my thoughts. I will report back. I might even sprinkle a little extra bonus. Who knows what I may do, but I will be talking about it. Um, now this past weekend, my family and I traveled to Brooklyn, New York, and we had an amazing time going to see um, the Jay-Z exhibit that was inside of the Brooklyn uh, Public Library. A um, few pointers. One, there could be possibly be a line. This is the last weekend for Jay-Z's birthday is on the 4th. That is going to be the last day. In addition to that, um, obviously I expect way bigger crowds for the people who were literally trying to do a last ditch effort. So you got to pack some patience. Um, it's a little cold, so bundle up. Another thing is there are two floors. Somebody is going to direct you to either stay on the first floor or go to the second. Now in our situation, when we got there, God is good. We went straight to the second floor, which actually worked out better for us because the first floor is kind of open. There's a little bit of more space. Once you get to the top, it's a little tight. Um, they're going to try to move you through little pro tip. You can stay in the room that you're in. If you need to you know, see more, like you didn't feel like you've seen enough or you didn't get a chance to, you know, watch the videos and things you can just stand to the little, you know, to the side. So other people who want to come through can, so I will suggest that, um, again, it's all ages. It is free. You do have to live in New York in order to get one of the member, uh, the, the, library cars that are like i guess keepsakes now you can use them if you're in the brooklyn area and you live or in new, if you live in new york you can get a um library card because just like anything else but if you don't you won't be able to get it um i thought it was a good time we had an amazing time we got my kids was able to learn about the conversations about jay-z now i am a parent that's going to always keep it real we're going to tell the kid we told the kids like hey this is what he did this is where he's at now. These are the choices that he made. You need to figure out a way to avoid the part where he did this part, obviously in the drugs and the use of that or selling of that, I should say, not the use, but the selling of it and focus on how to become an entrepreneur, how to own the things that you want to own, to get to the point where you can control your destiny. Cause that's really the goal, right? And so we just had a great time. We had great food. We walked around the city a little bit. We enjoyed it. It was a great time. Um, if you're looking to go there again, I can't stress enough. It's supposed to end on December the 4th, which is Jay-Z's birthday. So have a good time and enjoy it. Uh, again, pack patience because people are going to be all around doing things, stopping in front of you. It's just like being at anything else. So now that we've given Jay-Z and Beyonce the props, the one last thing I want to talk about is this whole T.I. and King situation. If you've been living under a rock, you should know that T.I. and King got into some type of verbal altercation. I'm not sure if his mother was there. I'm assuming she might have been. However, what we don't know is we really don't know the premise as to what started this argument. We just know that they had one. We know that King said, you know, had put out that he did not live with tiny and ti which are his parents which we all knew that if you saw the show so that wasn't a shock i think the shock is that he wants to say that you know at the end of the day you know he did his thing and he and he didn't have his parents around and things like that both of those can be true he could actually be um disrespectful in his delivery he could be wrong in the way that in which he did it. He could be wrong in the fact that he did it at the wrong place and especially at the wrong time. I just don't feel like as if those are his truths that there's nothing wrong with what he said. It could just be a delivery situation. Now, I know that's going to ruffle some of the feathers, especially from the old school folks, because a lot of old school people are taught that when you have an, an elder and adult that you pretty much are seen, you know, seen but not heard. Um if that works for you and that's where you are, I can't judge you. That's not my business. I'm just saying that for me, I have always decided, to always start off with giving people general respect, right? But I feel like at some point, at some point, the truth has to be what it is. And so if his truth is that he's feeling some type of way because he wasn't raised by them, that's his truth. There's nothing that anybody can take from him. Um, saying things like, oh, we know everybody wants to put everything online. That's true. And it can be annoying at times seeing people put certain things online, but people have a right to put what they choose to put on there. You don't got to agree with it. It's just that they have that, they have a right. Um, 
but I'm not taking sides because again, there's always two sides of a coin and whatever King was feeling at that moment, obviously escalated, you know, to the point of what everybody saw the bits and pieces of everything. Cause again, nobody knows what they saw. Nobody knows what they heard unless they were there. We were not there. We're only seeing sound bites. We're only seeing small clips. We're all making these conversa uh, conversations and observations on what we saw. We don't know everything. So King is saying he is standing on business. God bless standing on business. But I need some of y'all to stop saying stand on business when you ain't been on nobody's business, but everybody else's and not your own. Okay. So I need you to handle your affairs. If you're going to keep saying afraid that you're standing on business, because standing on business means you're taking care of the things that concern you and those who are surrounding you. Lastly, I just want to talk about, listen, is anybody else dealing with migraines? I feel like... I feel like part of the migraines is my responsibility just from, I feel like I'm not eating or drinking enough. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I'm going to get a hold to it because I can't go another week going through another set of migraines. I just cannot. So for those who suffer, you're not alone. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that I keep myself as balanced as possible and get as, you know, as healthy as I possibly can. I just need to increase my water and make sure I'm drinking, eating the right things and all that stuff. So I will be focused on that. We're about to go into our guest. I, again, can't preface enough how excited, how legitimately excited that I am that we have a writer, a fellow writer who, again, when you see writers, writers, we just have an understanding. Writers are usually readers. Readers are good writers as well. And I just, I just want to get into this conversation. Today's guest is Sheila Bender, who is a poet, an essayist a memorist and a master teacher who has helped hundreds of people write from personal experience. She believes that when it comes to writing in progress, there is no bad writing, only opportunities for good writing. She has served as a distinguished lecturer in poetry for Seattle University, taught writing at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, and for the Centrum Foundation's Port Townsend, Washington writers conference along with many other venues she has founded writing it real.com which is an online instructional magazine focused on writing from personal experience and speaks on writing to heal grief overcoming writer's block and writing uh, craft skills for new and experienced writers and prose there is something that is magnetic about when you decide to, to put your own story onto paper or typing or however you write it is a beautiful thing. Now, it's a scary thing. It is a learning tool. It's a learning curve. And I talked to Sheila about what is a good, what, you know, good writers. We talked about writer's block, but we also talked about why people don't start. They want to become a writer. They want to do this thing, but they just don't start. How do we keep the fuel going for just doing something that we feel is a part of something? Like when you wake up and you feel like I'm an amazing writer, like I love to write and I can tell, I know off the bat when I'm feeling like that, that moment where I don't want to do it, right? When I don't want to write. And those moments do happen even with me being a, a writer for so long, but I get pure joy writing content and making these conversations go and having these things come out because I just enjoy the process. I don't enjoy every part of the process, but I do enjoy the actual writing part. I enjoy putting my thoughts into fruition. I enjoy that part. So for anyone who has thought, man, I really would like to start in something. It doesn't have to be writing. It can be whatever it is. There will be information that you can listen to that this will tug at you and get you motivated to pick up wherever you may have stopped, wherever you may have taken a break, whatever you have decided that you weren't sure if you were ready to start. This conversation is that conversation for you. So Without further ado, Sheila, let's have that conversation. All right, Conversations with Toy Family. It is another wonderful Friday, and we're here with you and joining with you. And we have a guest today, and you've already heard me read her amazing bio. We have Sheila here, and we're going to talk about the power of writing. Now, for so many people who, they send me messages all the time. They say, how do you get started? Like, how do you get started with writing? Because I don't feel like I'm a good writer. We're going to talk about that very topic today. Um, for those who don't know, I have started my blog before I became a podcaster, literally writing about myself. And I continue to do that to this day because 
I feel like personal experience is how we connect and it also is a form of healing as well. So we have Sheila here who knows all about that as we talk about writing, you know, what makes a good writer when people say I'm not a good writer, which is one of the biggest things that I hear about people saying I have this desire to write, but how do I get started? So Sheila, how do or how does one well, get started? It's funny to that to, I mean we all feel that way, honestly, even if you have written books and you start again. You still feel like, how do I get started? Who will ever want to read this? Um, Do I have anything important to say? Hasn't it already been said by everybody else? You know, that those questions never go away. But what does happen once you do get started is you get comfortable with the fact that you're still going to have those questions and you kind of push them aside. But that said, first, I'm laughing because I just read a quote from Mark Twain and it was this, to get ahead one must start. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it seems, you know, very funny like he was, but also very wise. And then the question becomes, how do I start? And um, we start by just writing. Writers write. That's the basic definition of a writer. And uh, some very wise teachers have suggested, like a man named Peter Elbow, who um, I'm in the state of Washington. He was a professor in, in Olympia, Washington, uh, he had people do what he called, um, what did he call it? Well, the, what it was, was free writing without stopping, no matter what. If you had nothing to say, then for 10 minutes, just say the same nothing. And the miracle that happens is you start saying something because that's boring and, and thoughts come and we write them. And so once we get used to writing and writing and writing and writing, um, then it becomes the question of how do I reach somebody else if I want to? Is it just for me, which is fine, but do I want someone else to read it and understand what I've been through or what I want to share? And that sometimes gets us scared because these are very, it makes us vulnerable. Um, It's also very enriching when someone outside of your heart and mind gets it. So I think people who write, even if it's journal writing, which they consider personal, there comes a time when they might want to share what they've written, maybe not the whole journal, but parts that have been really important to them. So I think that um, knowing that you're in good company, that the tribe of writers have similar feelings to you is actually a help. And remembering what Mark Twain said about to get ahead, you must start. And then to start with a a free write in which you just set a timer uh, on your on your phone or on your oven timer and just write until it rings and just keep writing. And it's it, I've done this a number of times when I thought I had nothing to say and I've done it with classes and there isn't anyone who doesn't find something to say. And I think what happens with the repeating repetition, just like physical activity makes you want to write sometimes because there's a rhythm and a sound to your feet on the ground. Um, So does uh, typing or pen across the page. There's something that goes on that makes you say something, something surprising usually. So though a long answer, but in addition to those ways, I felt that one of the biggest problems people had was that they felt like they were boring themselves. Say that now the 10 minutes was over. Now what, you know? And I wrote a book called A Year in the Life, Journaling for Self-Discovery. And that book is still available through something called the International Association for Journal Writing.org, IAJW.org. And the premise of that book is let's steal strategies from published writers. What do we respond to when we're reading something we like and try to imitate it, not with those words, but with their patterns. So if they're writing about a telephone being silent and how much excruciating, how excruciating that is because the call is supposed to come from a girlfriend who the person writing is absolutely sure it's over. And the telephone is just this mute object. Um, Then you think, well, what if I wrote about my telephone? Mm. What do I think of my telephone? What do I think of my callers and whatever I want to say? So the whole book is, is, a journaling exercise for every day of the year, if people want to do that, or one a week, however people want to do it. That's so my, 
I have another question because I hear this quite often, which I always, again, tell the same thing to, to encourage people because there's some people who, for whatever reason, whatever they're, they've gone through, like they have this conceived notion that one, if they can't read well, they won't be able to write well. And sometimes mm -hmm. the way that we read is the way that we write. And so some people get caught up in not having the skill set that they feel they need to be able to put their words into a cleaned up version of whatever it is that they're trying to say. How do, how do, what do you say to a person that is, has those two correlations? They read like yeah. they write and they write like they read. Okay. Um, at the heart, I would say what a teacher of mine said, the poet David Wagner, he said, writing is done in three stages. In the first stage, you're like a, a wild, mad scientist. You're just putting down anything. He called it inventing. You're just inventing your material. It's your invention. So however, however it comes on the page, there it is. The second stage, if you're a writer, is shaping it. What does it want to be? What, you know, is it a conversation? Is it an argument? Is it just a beautiful description and observation? Is it a, a harangue? Is it a rant? Is it praise? Is it a prayer? These are the things we notice when we look at it ourselves. And then we might rewrite it a little bit, reshape it, reorganize it. So it, it sounds, at least to us, how we think it should. And then lastly, the thing we learn in school, which is editing. And if we do that too early, which it sounds like people who are afraid they can't write well enough are doing, they're thinking of what the teacher wanted. And that's the last stage. And that's up to you if you want to get there or not. You know, um, sometimes the, the people who write with phrasing that's not traditional, that's phrasing that's not like school language, are actually like writing really well. <laughs> but their teacher, perhaps way back when, would not have thought that. So they don't think that, but it can. And uh, I think that th at that point, if a person has written and wonders about that, then it may be time to share it and ask some people, trusted people, um, could they listen? Could they, first of all, listen to you read it? And and then secondly, does it does my page look like how I read it? You know, mm -hmm. matching. So I think finding trusted listeners, finding people that will cheerlead you and appreciate you is really important. Um, it doesn't go away no matter how many times you've published. I have a writing group. We meet once a month. I send them things I'm working on. They have responses and reactions. And then I think about them. Another thing I was taught was author and authority come from the same root. So mm -hmm. you are the authority on your own writing. If it pleases you, if you think what you've said satisfies you, it's probably fine. If you want it to make sense to somebody else who may not be able to read it the way you do, then you have decisions to make. And there's lots of help out there. That's the final thing. In school, you don't have that kind of help. You just do the assignments, hand them in, take the test. It's timed. You're done. That's it. But out in the real world, plenty of help, plenty of help online at, at you know, good editors, friends, listeners, right? They're all there. I so, agree. Yeah. Now, what about for me? And I know this was my personal journey with writing. For me, again, writing became therapeutic. Um, I started because I went to I was in the care of a, of a therapist. She was telling me I was going for postpartum depression. And she was like, what is something that you can do that you love to do that is outside of your, your title of parent or mom? And mm -hmm. I was telling her how much I love to write. And she is the one who encouraged me to start my blog. A lot of people have these personal experiences that they want to put to paper or typing or however they're doing it. And sometimes they feel as if one, again, you talk about that vulnerability of being vulnerable to tell your story because you're worried about what people are going to say partially, but the part of it, just putting that into your heart, basically into the writing. Can you talk to those who are listening about how therapeutic writing can actually be? Yes. And it has been for me and it sounds like it was for you. There's some evidence, a lot of evidence that just the fact of writing in a journal, even if you never read it, is therapeutic because we have speech. 
We have the way to communicate ideas and feelings and just doing it as opposed to remaining silent, even if it's just to ourselves, is already therapeutic. My own feeling about writing is that when you're writing, can also reach somebody outside of yourself. It's like it's like a a, a loop, a circle. You change. You change because you've written it, but you change again because somebody else has appreciated it, understood it, resonated with it, been inspired by it, all the things I'm sure that your blog is doing. So, and I think it's the best therapy because it comes from you, yourself. Right. And uh, so that's what I think about its healing properties. The vulnerability is enormous because some of us have family secrets to tell. Mm -hmm. Some of us have our own secrets to tell. Um, And we feel guilty. We feel like we shouldn't be saying it. In fact, a lot of us were told not to say it. We're not allowed to tell anything that's going on, right? Right. But if you're a writer at heart, and I love that you mentioned the heart, you were a writer at heart, you're going to do it anyway, because you have to. It's like somebody who wants to dance and they're told they can't, they have to sit at a desk that should be their job forever. No dancing. They right. wouldn't be able to do it. We can't either. We have to do it. So um, the interesting thing to me is the more we do it, the less vulnerable we feel because we get used to it being vulnerable. Mm-hmm. But also we find people, we find like-minded people who like you have followers on your podcast, on your blog, and just having that enrichment of appreciation changes your own feeling about being vulnerable. It's bearable um, right. because it's worthy. And a, a writer who I really like is Kim Stafford. His father is a very famous poet, um, William Stafford. And Kim Stafford is a poet and a prose writer and a teacher. And he, I took a class with him and he left us with these words, keep worthy company. Writers must keep worthy company. And uh, there's so many ways to do that now. There, If you're a poet, there are so many sites online where you can get a, a poem every day into your inbox, where you can go and find listings of poems by subject, theme, poet, title, all kinds of ways. And that for me is really important because that's where I am at heart. I'm a poet, although I write my memoir and personal essay and instructional books. But where it all started was with the poets. So... And then when you're in a group of poets, whether they're online or in in literature um, or blog posts, which can become quite poetic, um, you're in worthy company. You may never meet face to face, but they're your they're your tribe. They're there for you. I want to talk about writer's block because I do feel that we have all experienced it to some degree. For some of us, it's writer's block that lasts maybe a, a, a while, doesn't happen, doesn't, it's not a long stretch. For me, I don't usually have long stretches of writer's block because I'm writing about things that are dear to me. Yes. But I've had it happen or other people have had it happen. And I feel like with people, especially when you first start, they feel like they have to have all these you know, different topics ready to go. And then they experience their first writer's block and it could be not necessarily detrimental and stop them, but it can put a pause in their journey in writing. What do you, what do you have to say about that? We all have it. That's for sure. And I think in addition to what you're saying, our culture keeps us busy, just keeps us very busy. And we have a lot of daily things to take care of. And we think that's not what writers write about. So I think one way over writer's block is to write about daily things, write about the laundry. Um, I just heard a poem by a man who was writing about his wife toddling down the hallway with an armful of warm clothing from the dryer. And when she came to where he was sitting, she put the clothing up to his face so he could feel the warmth. And he captured that. I mean, there's so many little things that go on all day that we might not feel are uh, the deepest triggers for writing, But they are. Observation is the way out of writer's block. So my suggestion is go to a window, sit outside, um, write about what you see, whether you know why you're doing it or not. But use use the five senses when you're writing about whatever it is. Let's hear something. Let's hear something, smell something, taste something, um, 
touch something and I'm missing one, I'm sure. Taste, touch, smell. And help me. <laughs> we can taste, we can touch, we can hear, we can smell, and we can see. Um, yes. And we we rely a lot on seeing at, in writing. But if you push yourself to think, what do I hear? What is it like? If I'm hearing tires in chains running over snow, what does that sound like? That's another way to leap away from the moment into some memory um, to write about. So I think just sitting there, even for just 10 minutes, observing and writing your observations, describing them with the five senses, you're going to be writing. And I, I just want to add that there's this thing called inertia and inertia. We usually think of it as just, you know, hard to get up from a chair and go exercise, but it also works the other way. If you've been busy exercising, it can make it hard to sit down. So it just means a change in your state of being. And uh, we have, we go through that all the time. So sometimes we have to force ourselves to hit the page, you know, and I think this, that little way goes a long distance describing what you, what you're experiencing. I want to talk about what you found it with writing it real. How did that come about? And what are some of the ways that you're seeing what you're doing, helping others now? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. And how are you helping others now? Okay. Well, I think it came about, I, it's easy for me to tell you how it came about. I was already writing. I was already publishing. And I was about to write a memoir, I thought, about raising children. And my son died in a snowboarding accident. Um he was with his fiance's family and they were at Breckenridge in Colorado. Um, he went head first into a tree. The conditions had, it was one of those days where the temperature had warmed up. Then he went back out and had in the interim from lunch, it had frozen over. And so it was slick. And on that same day, two other people died in the avalanche. So it was definitely a freaky thing. And I, I, you can imagine the devastating thing. So part of my grieving was to feel like I had to bring his energy in the world forward and live with it in me because he wasn't here to do that. And he wasn't a writer. He was an architect, but his whole thing was about making spaces for people livable, even outdoor spaces where benches are placed, things like that. He put a lot of energy into that. So I thought, well, how could I do something with as much commitment? And that's how Writing It Real was born. Um, my husband was in computer networking and he, in those days, there weren't these easy programs to make websites. So we had to be individually programmed. He had a friend who did that. He helped me with it. Um, my husband helped me with it. And I just had a mailing list of people who had attended my classes and I sent it out. I sent out an announcement here was writing it real. And in those days, it was going to be one article about writing a week, kind of like a blog. Oh, we don't, it was 2002. I don't think that we were using that term yet. No. And pretty soon the internet started growing up and it was easier to do online classes. And I just kept doing this and doing this. And then pretty soon I was hearing about how writing had changed people's lives. I already knew it could. And it was certainly changing mine because I don't really know if I could have survived the grief without writing. I, there are other ways. People have other talents, but writing was mine. And so I wrote a memoir called A New Theology, Turning to Poetry in a Time of Grief, um, which covered the six months after my son died, because uh, maybe it's only five, that he was about to be married. And the question I kept having that was haunting me is how... Are we all going to be on that day when we should have been at a wedding? And so it's a book that goes back into his, at times, childhood, his engagement, um, my connection with his bride's family. And what I ended up doing, unbeknownst to me, I felt like I was trying to write myself into a place where I could accept this and know how I was going to go on. What I also did was I resurrected my son. And the way I know that is people would say, I didn't know your son, but I feel like I do now. And I think that's a way that that changes people's lives too, that they can 
through any one person's writing, we can live vicariously and have more experience especially people who maybe haven't had a huge loss, but they read about it and they know that it could happen. Not, maybe not the same way, but there's no one alive who hasn't lost somebody to, to dying. And um, well, maybe an infant baby hasn't yet, but you know what I mean as we get older. And the other thing is um, people resonate because they have had losses. And so you're, help, you're helping by right writing for others as well as people helping themselves by writing it's a long answer but i hope it addresses what you said well one condolences my condolences to you and your family and i know for a fact how healing writing can be and i'm so happy that you did take that opportunity to do that because you wouldn't have writing it real if you hadn't done that and I know yeah. that you talk about writing, you know, through your grief. Do you encourage other people to do the same? If they can. I mean, there are people who can't yet. I mean, some people can start writing the day after because they just have to. And other people say, no, it's too soon. Everything's too raw. I just want to sit here with it, which is fine. Then some people write because they don't want to forget one moment of the life of the person who's not here anymore or they want to really hear themselves articulate what grief is like for them. And so um, they begin. And and so anybody, my own feeling is if a person wants to write, they can write. They wouldn't think of it if they couldn't do it. I really believe that. They wouldn't say, oh, I want to write a book, unless possibly they could. But of course, first they have to learn how to write shorter pieces, maybe. And maybe in doing that, they'll abandon the book and just be happy with a collection of poems and um, short stories or vignettes from life or a blog. I mean, we, we say book because that's what, that's like the icon of writing, right? Are all the books, but there are so many other ways to be a, be successful in writing um, and sharing with others. Yeah. So um, I do encourage people and I, I just, I'd love to read from a little book that I wrote after I wrote my memoir. I wrote a book called, Sorrow's Words, Writing Exercises to Heal Grief. And I, I'm going to, one of them is, and therapists use this idea a lot, is to write a letter to the deceased so that you can continue your conversation and feel in the company of the person to whom you're writing. So um, in my own, after my memoir, for years, I wrote poems about grief and um, they began to include other people like my father. Um and my book, that one is called Since Then, Poems and Short Prose. And it's my newest book. But from the memoir, which preceded it, I wrote this little book. And I, I want to, oh, I was going to say that in the book with poems, every of the four parts starts with a letter to my son. Um, because he's the one in grief that I've wanted to talk to. Right. All right. So here's a, a quick one. Dear Seth. These days, I find myself calling you Sunboat after a Greek myth I read recently when I looked up the meaning of your name, something I'm not sure I ever did, even when your father and I selected that name for you. In the myth, a hero, Seth, has the job of keeping the sun from disappearing. The story goes that the dragon Apophis would from time to time devour the sunboat of Ra as it sailed the skies. When Apophis swallowed the boat, Seth and a friend had to cut a hole in his stomach to keep the world from being plunged into darkness. Losing you plunged me into darkness, but somehow the sun rises and it sets and it calls to me each day as I watch it rise and watch it set. I know you are the sunboat who cuts the hole through which light and poetry arrive. I am so grateful, Seth, as Ra must have been to his Seth. So, um, that was really beautiful, first of all. <laughs> it, it really was. And um, I love the fact that you call him sun, sun, Sunboat. Sunboat. Like and so in the in the writing, I spell it S-O-N when I call him Sunboat. But of course, for Ra, it was S-U-N. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes I, I just, sometimes in writing, we have the opportunity to personify something that isn't really a person, to make a person out of it. So I, if you would let me, I would love to read another poem. It's not very long in which 
I do that thing that I just described about the the daily. I mean, grief is an extraordinary big thing. Love is a big thing. Anger is a big thing. But how do we write that so someone else really feels it right? With specifics, with the five senses. So here's a poem about grief that's very daily. I call it Reload. I load the dishwasher, washing machine, pantry, while grief sweeps shards of a shattered moon. I go for a drive into sunlight and she scrambles into the passenger seat beside me. Once my son drank milk from a half gallon carton before my eyes. Once he picked out a dining room fixture and installed light for us. Once he caulked our sink. Once we were short of breath together in the Rockies and once we rode mountain bikes up curbs. Once he said his sister's reading made him bored, and then he went to college and began to enjoy books. Grief does not smile with me. She listens to every wishful breath in and tearful one out. So we live with our emotions and we can write from them and we can personify them so that they become a being in our writing. And we don't have to reach very far from what is around us, our cars, our dishwasher our memories. And so that's what inspired me to do it that way. I love that you are definitely inspiring other people. But my last question for you would be, how do you take care of you? What is, what is your self care go to? Like, how do you pour back into you? Because sometimes with writing, especially when you have your vulnerable moments, you feel like you're putting your whole heart, your whole soul. I mean, everything that you have with inside of you on to paper or typing, however you're doing it, but how do you pour back into your cup? Because I know for me, sometimes writing can be exhausting, not because I don't love it, because I absolutely love it. I love it every day I can write, mm-hmm. but sometimes when you pour out, you you feel empty. So how do you pour back into you? I, I'm a pretty gregarious person, even though at heart, I'm sort of a quiet, shy person. So sometimes it's about connecting with other people, going for a walk with somebody. Um, That is to me, being outside, just having conversation is helpful. I like that. Um, I garden and that's been since my son died. I spent a year with the only thing I wanted to do was to make things grow. So I had a patio full of pots, full of plants, um, and I was nurturing them. And then I decided to plant a vegetable garden and then it got bigger and then it had fruit trees. And (laughs) now it is my go-to place. I mean, there's always something to look at. And a lot of my poetry has come from that too. So I'll go out there and just sort of walk around and see what's growing and what's been being eaten by the slugs and the birds and, um, what needs a little something like doesn't need to be tied against a trellis. Um, And sometimes nothing needs to be done. I just need to be out there looking. And uh, of course, a good time of year is when you can go out there and grab something to eat like a tomato (laughs) or a pea. So gardening has become a very big way of doing that. It's an easy way to get out into nature because it's right at my house. Um, But walking, walking and observing, um, My my grandchildren are older now. They're 21 and 18 and they're not living at home. But uh, when they did, playing with them was always, always a source of joy. Um, And I remember so many, I sometimes talk like they talked because it's fun for me to hear that the way they pronounced words. So there's another way of connecting is uh, with kids. I think kids are fabulous. And sometimes I would read my writing in the early days. I would just read it to my four-year-old daughter. And she would listen. And that meant the world to me. So that was another way of of closing that loop of feeling like I was heard and I could rest now. Cooking is another one. I think uh, now that I'm not raising children and I don't have to rush to have dinner, it's more fun. (laughs) So I can add that to my list now. (laughs) Uh, I can attest that I'm looking forward to that moment. I'm not there yet. (laughs) It happens a little too quickly, as they all say, but... Yeah, uh, it does make cooking easier. <laughs> so yeah. we've heard your, you know, you've encouraging those who one had the desire to write and didn't know where to start, um, how to start and how to just continue going and, you know, combating the writer's block. And we've talked about the desire to, to write and we talked about your grief in writing. We talked about what you do now with um writing real, but 
What I want to know is if somebody's listening right now and they're saying, I want more information, I want to get to talk with you, I want to sit down and pick your brain a little bit more or sign up for one of your courses, how would they do that? They would find my website, which is, um, they'll see it in your blog, oh, when you, in the blog or someplace where you tell who yes, I am. In the show but, notes, I tell everybody that every, if, yeah. if you hear a website being said, it will always yes, be. Yes, that's always notes. hard, but it's writing it real, writing like handwriting, writing it, I-T-R-E-A-L. And I spell it because people over the phone who aren't writers have often asked me really funny things about what I what that is, but it's it's writingitreal.com or you can use my name. Sheila Bender will often get you right there as well. And um, I'd love to hear from you. There's under about, there's a contact. And so you can just click on that and it will go right to me. And you can tell me that you heard this conversation. That would be really nice for me. And we could go from there. That's amazing. And again, if for those who are listening, as I know some people are listening to it while they're being active or doing something, remember every time there is a website or anything um, and all of the things that um, Sheila has, you have quite uh, a lot of different sites that they can go to for books and all kinds of things. They will all, every last one of them will be in the show notes. So all you have to do is click on it. You don't even have to think. Just click, 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 and you will get to Sheila, I promise. How oh, good. Thank Sheila, you. Thank you so much for being a part of our conversation today. Again, as a fellow writer, I was nothing but excited to talk with you because from one writer to another, I get it. <laughs> I do <laughs> understand. So yeah. it's not often that I actually probably one of the, uh, there's people who write like as part of what they do, but not their heart into it. It's not what they do. And yeah. so speaking with you is just refreshing. And I guess just another way for me to encourage me to keep going too. Keep on writing. I'll just quote one other writer, the novelist Ron Carlson, a short story writer. He says to writers, write, don't think. That's his mantra. <laughs> and I think and that's it actually does that's work. Yeah. It does work. Because when you think too much, you won't do. You'll have every excuse. You'll make every, you can make up a thousand excuses, but right. if you just go ahead and do it. Right. So that's a writing things. exercise right there. Right. Write your excuses. <laughs> write all your excuses. And I bet you, you'll get tired of writing those excuses and you'll just keep going. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, thank you. No problem. All right. Now, what did you think? I enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed hearing someone else encourage the ability to write is is a, it's magnetic. It is just everything. You know, again, you don't have to have it all put together. It doesn't have to be super polished, but just doing your best to start and not being or even being afraid but just continuing on there's just nothing better so i hope that this episode something from this episode whether we were talking about something that hit a nail on the head for you at the beginning or we talked about all kind of things going on with beyonce and all these different different topics um something with the conversation with sheila i hope that most importantly has touched you and again, I hope that you hear when you're listening to these podcast episodes that I am just like you. I deal with my own levels of mental health, anxiety, depression, all kinds of different things that I'm dealing with. But I show up for myself as much as I can every single day. And I feel like that tenacity to not want to give up and to continue and pushing through my feelings, being honest about those feelings and moving forward is just the best way to handle things. I will obviously, like I said in the show, will make sure that I put all of the links that you can reach Sheila should you have some further questions, should you want to get consultation, whatever the case may be. I'm going to place that in the show notes. I am so grateful for each and every last one of you. Uh, please let me know. I, you can find me on social media as Toy Time Blog. Even if whatever I'm posting isn't about Beyonce, but you want to give me your take on that, that's fine. Give it to me. Um, if you want to send it to my DM, that's fine too. Send it to me. Either way, I just hope that everybody, everybody finds it in their heart to have a good weekend don't waste this weekend don't waste time it's the first week it's not even the first week but it's the first few days of december you have so much but so little time don't feel rushed i know um 
Everybody's going to be telling you that you have to have everything together. Everything has to be a certain way. Just let things flow. Like when you get to the point where you can start to let some things just simply flow without you having to feel like you have to control every single aspect of every single thing, you will find that you are in a situation where you're not as stressful taking on everybody else's stress. So find one activity that you enjoy, something that will fill your cup. Do that activity. If you can do it multiple times this weekend, go right on ahead and do it. But make sure that you take care of yourself. We will be back next week with a brand new episode of Conversations with Toy. I do thank you for listening. Please do three things for me. One, I'm hoping that you've gotten to this point. You've listened to the first whole episode, this whole episode. So you've done well. Then I want you to share this with someone else. And then lastly, I want you to go to whatever platform you listen to this at. I want you to leave an amazing review. Okay, three things. We're going to listen. We're going to share. We're going to review. All right. Have the most amazing weekend. And I look forward to speaking with you again with Conversations with Toy. Thank you as always for joining me. And I know that even in the deepest or joyful conversations, that there's something we can learn and apply. Until next time, I hope that you are doing better. If not, we will be back to talk some more and handle it. Peace to you and yours. Stay grounded.